So today's topic is photographing birds. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on opportunities that we have in this area. Start with general tips on bird photography, then talk about what you can do with your smartphones, and then go into a fairly technical piece on using your autofocus, exposure, and different things that you can do if you have a camera that allows you to manipulate settings. So birds are challenging um, as a species to, as a group to be able to photograph. Uh, birds move very rapidly. Uh, so they are a challenge to be able to acquire focus and to get a good image of them. Birds prefer to be active, a lot of them, during uh, early in the day and later at night. Uh, they also tend to want to always sit in a tree with the sun behind them so that they're backlit. And no matter what you do with a bird, that bird is never in the place you want it optimally for photography. The other problem that we have with uh, photographing a lot of the small birds is that birds for their own survival like to be in, in clusters or areas of brush and understory and leaves. So a lot of times the challenge is to be able to isolate that bird from a busy background. And then composition, I've, I've sat and wanted and wait it and wait it and wait it and say, okay, three more steps this way and you'll be perfect in the way I want you to frame. And of course the bird will never be cooperative. Some species are easier to photograph than others. And even within species, I've noticed that environmentally, it depends on where you are. Uh, one example is uh, there's uh, sandhill cranes. And if you've been to New Mexico at Bosque de la Pache, you can almost walk up to them. Or in Florida, the sandhill cranes are extremely tame. But when you go to the Platte River, when they're migrating through the midsection of the country, if you even roll down your car window, a hundred of them will take off. So it's the same species of bird, but because they're on the migration, because the central flyway, those birds are hunted there, they're not hunted in other places like Florida, uh, they're, they're a whole different um, strategy for having to photograph them. And a lot of bird photography, like all wildlife photography, is about getting to know your subject. So I do want to talk about wildlife ethics because as a photographer, when I first started looking at incredible pictures of, of birds in flight, uh, little kingfishers that are diving down and being able to get tiny fish, or owls that are these incredible pictures of an owl coming towards you with its wings out and with its talons just ready to plunge down and get that, that little prey object. Um, what I learned in doing a lot of photography of birds is that different photographers have different standards in terms of their ethics of, of what they will do in terms of setting up and wanting birds to, to come in or bait them. So for me, my first rule is that as a photographer, because I want to educate people about species, is that I need to put myself in a situation where there's no harm ever done to the species as best I can avoid it. Not to alter or destroy the habitat they're in, that being changing the habitat so that you can get a better picture. I've seen people break branches and do different things to be able to alter the habitat. Um, that's, that's really to me, not an ethical way of being a good wildlife photographer. Uh, one thing that I do like to be able to do is to, uh, I love observing bird nests and breeding and breeding rituals that, that birds may have. But in the breeding season, I'm sorry, I went ahead of myself. In the breeding season, it's really, it's really important to, to make sure that you don't disturb 
birds on nests, because if you disturb a bird on nest and it's bad weather, uh, that bird can lose uh, the investment it's made in, in its young. And so it's really important as, as, as tempting as it is to get near a bird nest, it's really important to give them room and make sure they're not, they're not being stressed. Um, and to know what signs of stress are, you know, is the bird altering its behavior because you're there? Um, when we do trips, like particularly with mammals and grizzly bears um, and polar bears, as you watch, their, their, um, they start to yawn, um, a grizzly bear and a polar bear, when they get anxious, they, they yawn, they're not tired, it's an anxiety. So the same thing with birds, are you causing stress to, to that bird or did it look up and is it going back to the behavior it was doing before? The other thing is to avoid making a wild animal used to human presence. And some of them, uh, already are that way. The first time that I started really noticing great blue herons was on the, the Gulf Coast. And the, the people who are fishing are, are throwing them fish all the time so that they're used to people. But I wanna keep my, my birds, my wildlife wild. I don't want them to the point where they know at a certain time of day, they come and uh, will get fed and become non-wild. And then keeping feeders safe for birds. And the thing about feeding birds is, to me, there's a difference between, I feed birds not just so I can photograph them. There are some uh, photographers that will put out a live mouse only when they're there so that that snowy owl will come in and pounce on, on the mouse. And for me, what happens to that snowy owl the days that that photographer is not there. If it starts getting dependent on that food, um, you need to do it consistently. And if you're feeding birds to do it because you're feeding them to augment their um, well-being over the winter months, not just so that you get a, a photographic opportunity. Uh, but if you do put bird feeders out, there's ways of doing it that that make it a little bit better for feeding birds. So for me, the first thing is to have and to commit to, um, to ethics, because particularly with birds, I've been on so many trips where I start to feel really uncomfortable with what we're doing as a, as a group with, with those, those birds. Um, that's not the goal of wildlife photography. So you can create settings that are great for feeding um, birds that then allow you great opportunities to photograph them. Um, and so things that you can do is put your suet feeders either on logs or old stumps. Um, naturally, if a tree is going down in your yard and it's unsafe, you can, you can cut that tree um, but leave a good stump so that it can be both a place for feeding and, and nesting birds. <clears throat> for the smaller birds, um, and again, if you do it consistently and feed them, you can see in this picture all sorts of branches that are designed for birds to perch on either before they go over to a feeder or you can also put food and cups behind those branches so that now you've got, you've got birds that look like they're in a natural setting and are easier to photograph. Uh, so there's all sorts of creative ways that you can set up your bird feeding stations to allow for good um, pictures. And if you notice the um, way it's set up, there's some green trees behind this setup. This isn't my yard, this is one I found on the internet. So that what you want to do is set your feeders a distance away from a nice green background. And with the right depth of field, those little chickadees that are on that log with that pretty green background, that green background won't look like, um, like a conifer tree. It will look like a, a nice smooth background. So that's one thing as if you set your feeders up, uh, think about how far does does your feeder need to be at your f-stop that you're going to use so that when you look that there's a nice background. You wouldn't want to shoot, um, and 
I hate even using the word shoot, to photograph these birds towards those two trees in, in the right-hand side that are like a V, because that's gonna be a line in the background. So this photographer set up this whole setup so that the birds would be behind that, that green, um, those green pine needles that are back there. Uh, and the other thing that this photographer probably did is looked at where is the sun in relation to the birds for the time of day that they are often at the feeders. So all of that can be done strategically so that you create a nice photograph setting for, for birds. But again, if you're going to feed birds for the sake of photography, feed them consistently, not just for getting, getting your photo. So the most important thing is to understand birds. Uh, and this is true of any wildlife, but uh, birds will, if you know the bird, you will know a little bit about how to anticipate its behavior and how to get a really good photograph. Um, this sandhill crane is taken uh, in Nebraska during the, the migration. Uh, and I was in a photo blind. So time of day, wind, temperature, all affect bird behavior. Uh, birds do, most birds on a very windy day, if you're going out and there's a lot of wind, you're not gonna see a lot of birds unless you, you find where they're hunkered down. Um, temperature, when it gets really, really um, very hot in the summer, they're not as active. And you can, you can see if you observe the birds, the bigger birds will even pant. And you don't want to take a picture of a panting bird. It, it's just, you can see that they're, um, they're under stress. Uh, the cold, they're more active in the cold. Birds will also be extremely active right before um, a rainstorm. They, I think they know that the barometer is going down and they figure we better get, get our food while we can. The most important thing on, on particularly photographing birds that are, are taking off, um, birds will take off and land into the wind, just like an airplane. Um, particularly the bigger birds, the more they need that uplift on their wings. So um, you, you'll see like um, a whole bunch of sandhill cranes and they'll all be standing in the same direction in the Platte River. Um, the same thing here in our rivers, you might see geese that are getting ready to roost or settle for the night and they, they're gonna face towards the wind. That way, if an eagle or a predator comes, they're in the right direction for taking off. Um, so they always sense where the wind is. And so as a photographer, if you keep the wind and the sun to your back, you're going to be able to get better pictures of, of flight. The other thing is, um, is some birds, um, and this is like the fourth point down, um, they'll do certain behaviors right before they take off. Um, they will vocalize like a great blue heron if they're disturbed, like if you're sitting at Eastern Park or anywhere along the Shenandoah River and you hear the squawk of a bird, you, there's a canoe coming down, the, the great blue heron looks over to the canoe, they'll squawk usually before they take off. They make this vocalization. So if you hear the squawk, get ready, you might get a flight um, picture. The other thing that, um, that hummingbirds and flycatchers, they'll often go out and then return to the same branch. So if you just focus on that branch and you're patient, you might get that hummingbird or the flycatcher coming in to land on a particular branch. Raptors are birds of prey, um, hawks, eagles. Uh, if they've been sitting in a tree for a while, um, typically what they'll do is they'll, they'll sit in the tree and then if they may sit there and you might watch them for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden they start messing with their feathers and they get their feathers just so. And then they lean forward and you see like white coming out their butt which is, it's poop, but it's also uric acid. When raptors do that, they're, light, they're going to lighten their load and chances are they're gonna take off. And so that's a really good sign after you've been watching a raptor that it's ready to move. Kingfishers will hover before they dive. Kingfishers are one of the most 
skittery birds that 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 I've worked with other than in in Brazil they they've got them pretty tamed because they they will throw fish to a certain area so that you can just sit there and wait for the kingfishers to come in but our kingfishers the minute you get near them they they have that little rattle noise they make and then they just take off right away from you so one kingfishers are high on my list for getting um better pictures of i i need to i need to be able to get out in a kayak and and sit and try to not be there and pretend i don't a lot of times with birds i just pretend i don't care about them i'm like i don't care about you and then kingfisher will come uh, with ducks and, and geese also if one duck starts to fly usually the mate will take off so it's a good indication to get ready for a flight um, picture and our wood ducks, uh, you often hear the wood ducks will make a little vocalization, but the female is the one vocalizing. And I always like to watch ducks when you can tell the difference with most of them between the drakes and the hens is who makes that decision? Is it the male that takes off? Is it breeding time and the males are chasing some females and she's trying to see whether or not he's, he's going to be a good mate. But um, being able to anticipate is, is a really important part of knowing your subject and knowing what behaviors they do. Um, and to me, that goes beyond taking the picture. Then I start to really appreciate uh, those species a, a lot more. So a little bit about really understanding what these birds do and how do they behave, um, even with some nests that I've seen, you can almost start to say how, what's the timing of they're going into the nest and coming out. And um, if you've watched a nest over time, you'll start to see the deliveries of food increase pretty rapidly. And then as the young get a little bit older, they start withholding food. Uh, one time at, at, um, at the State Arboretum, I was watching uh, tree swallows and you could tell that there was only a, a one left in the nesting box and the other ones were all flying around and the adult would fly towards the front of the nest box, pretend to deliver food, but no food and it would take off and that, that little baby was so mad. And I just said, if I just stand here, I'm gonna see that baby fly. And it took hours, but there was a, it was almost like an intervention of the other birds coming to make sure that that one reluctant baby would, would fly from the nest. Um, and it's just, a, it, to me, watching birds like that, it's fun to get the photo, but it's, it's also really a connection with nature. And it's, it's pretty, uh, for me, meditative almost. So, um, Approaching birds, and this is true of almost any wildlife you're going to photograph, um, birds have a comfort zone. And if you step into beyond that comfort zone, they will leave. Um, and every bird, again, is different in terms of, of what that comfort zone is. Um, when, when I go hiking in the woods, I think about all the birds that saw me and I never saw them. Uh, their vision and their sensing for their own survival is, um, is really much better than ours. So just know if you see a bird, that bird's already seen you. Uh, there's just no way that, that unless it's a very young, juvenile, inexperienced bird, uh, they know you're there. So what do you do? You try to blend in with the environment as much as possible and to be quiet. And so the challenge of being quiet is you can be quiet and not speak, but our cameras make noise. So one thing, if you um, can do it, is to put your camera on silent mode. The mirrorless cameras make a, a noise um, that, that you can put it in pure silent mode. The danger of that is you can take a thousand pictures and not know it because you're not hearing that that shutter um, type of noise. But to be as quiet as possible, think about the clothing you're wearing. Um, are you wearing 
are you wearing clothes that that makes noise that some of my some of my coats uh, squeak more than others um, boots and then how do you walk so that you avoid stepping on twigs and sticks and you know just trying to really be stealthy and quiet in, in your movements the other thing and this is true with with most um, wildlife is if you approach very very slowly and you sort of zigzag rather than go straight um, you can you can give the bird that you're trying to approach a little bit more time to check you out to know whether or not you're a threat or not so a zigzag stop every few feet and then what I do is is um, what I, I'll take um, I'll take my photo from a little further out a safety photo just so I have that picture but I, I know in my mind, I'd like to get a little closer to be able to get detail. But I also know the chances of my um, having that bird fly off is just as great as my being able to get that safety picture. And I, I stay way back from, from nests. That's, that's the exception. Um, so, and I'll, I'll try to walk if the bird is eating or looking away or, or preening. When the bird starts to preen or clean its feathers, that's a relaxed time. And the bird, you know, you're, the bird's telling you, I'm, I'm not threatened by you because I can do something like clean my feathers. I know I'm not getting ready to just take off. And I have, um, I have crawled on my belly um, in our um, our pond on on my property in March there'll be wood ducks and they are just so there are some places wood ducks are in parks and people get these incredible pictures of wood ducks our wood ducks here um, will take off if they hear you at all and so and sometimes I can't even see them they're tucked into the vegetation and one day I probably spent 30 minutes like scooching on my stomach trying to get closer and closer and uh, got one picture before they they flew off and then I felt bad that they weren't in the pond anymore so I have belly crawled um, herons tend to be okay if you sort of belly crawl or slide along um, shorebirds you can also like get really nice pictures of wading birds and shorebirds if you if you sort of belly crawl slowly. So um, it's easier if, if you don't have to approach a bird, if you just, um, if a bird flies into where you are because you're sitting, sitting there, that's, that's even better. So there are, um, there are photo blinds and a lot of the bird photography that you see, um, people have done them from blinds. It really makes a, a huge difference. So the one blind in the upper left corner, I, I actually have it, it's a hunting blind and it pops up like a little tent. And what I do is, is I unzip the windows. Um, there are photo blinds that you can buy, but they're more expensive. Uh, so I unzip the the doors and the windows, and sometimes I'm small enough I can even lie down if if I'm at a pond or something in in the photo blind. Um, but you can you can those are fairly easy to get, and and if you really have a little setup where birds are, the picture on the on the right is uh, the Crane Trust in Nebraska. They have um, different types of photo blinds that you can set up in. This one is meant to be overnight in. Um, they have some, some blinds that they that you sort of sneak in at sun before sunrise and you sneak in before sunset and then you sneak back out. Um, long as you are very, very quiet because the last thing you want to do is have a few thousand birds have, take to the air when they're trying to feed to um, get ready for, for a really long migration. Uh, in one of the crane trust blinds that there, there was a, uh, their rules are in the, in the photo blinds you stay overnight in, um, that you're not to leave until the birds leave their roost area. Cause what they, what they do is they come to the Platte river during, during the day, the night to be safe from predators. And they're out in the cornfields eating during the day. And this one 
photo um, group from National Geographic or something, um, the cranes never left for 48 hours. They were, they were in the photo blind. And what they regretted is they ran out of um, cards and batteries. Um, but if you have an opportunity to do some photography from, from blinds, it's, it really is fun. Um, there's a photographer in Texas, Hector Astaga, and he, he has a ranch where the blinds are dug into the ground and there's water so you're eye level and you're sitting in the blinds and the birds don't see you. For most people, um, you, the picture on the, the bottom left um, is your, your car can serve as, as a blind. It's really remarkable. It, this happens a lot at the State Arboretum is I'll be like going down their, their little wildlife loop and I can get pictures of the birds in the, in the bushes as long as I stay in the car. And the key there is to have your windows already rolled down so they're not hearing the windows go up and down. Um, but somehow staying in the car is less alarming to the birds than opening the door and getting out. Um, so I take a lot of my, my bluebird pictures at the Arboretum from my car. I just sort of angle it right for the sun and I stay in the car and then the birds are more relaxed because they know you're contained and they, they can come and go. Uh, so the other thing, and I'm, I'm gonna mention this when we do birds in flight, is that you see the, the woman photographer, her hand is on the bottom of the, the lens. If you have a telephoto lens, she's got her lens foot is either to the side or up. That's better for securing it than holding it by the, the foot that would attach to the tripod. So definitely photo blinds. And if you don't have a photo blind, you can also, when birds are abundant in an area, you can also sit down um, in some vegetation and sort of make your own concealment and just sit there quietly. A lot of times I think people get impatient and they don't wait for the birds to come to them. So a little bit on, a, on equipment. And again, I, I think this looks like, um, I'm trying to, it looks like a Harris hawk to me. Um, sitting on this lens, I, I really think he was baited in too. I maybe have gotten cynical, but um, I think there was some reason why that hawk is sitting, sitting there um, like that. But what you see for this setup is for bird photography, if I can, um, I, I like to handhold because I'm more mobile with my, my camera gear. But if the lens and camera gets too heavy to have overhead, then um, the way that this camera is on the tripod is on what's called a gimbal head. And that allows you to move your camera as if you're, as if you're hand holding. So um, there are different types of, of heads you can get. Uh, this one is um, a Canadian company called Jabu. And I have one of those because it's real lightweight for travel. Um, but it, it makes being able to hold the, the camera gear much easier. It is helpful to have a longer lens because um, the further away you can be from birds, the more natural that, the more natural the interaction is going to be uh, with, with the birds. So I definitely do some of my photography on a tripod with a gimbal head. All of the photography I've done out of blinds is always that way. Um, there's also a device that's called a, um, a ground pod. And for those of you that can see my image in the corner, it looks like a Frisbee and you can actually make them out of a pie tin and you put your, your camera on that. And what this is designed to do is um, if you're doing ground photography, particularly shorebirds, is you just move the the ground pod in front of you, and you can put your you can put your um, your your tripod head on this sort of frisbee thing. But you don't have to have um, top end of the line equipment to do bird photography. And I'm going to demonstrate how you can do it with an iPhone. It is useful with an iPhone to have. Um, 
an inexpensive way of putting your your phone or your your um, camera phone on a tripod so that you can then back away from where the birds are. Um, and then there are devices where you can remote control trigger the phone, but you can also hook up your your headsets that came with the phone and the volume up or volume down button will activate the shutter. Or you can click run the video and then go away and just let it run in, um, for a while. So those are just some different things on equipment for, for bird photography. Uh, there are people who use uh, flash with, with bird photography to fill in for shadows. And I, I have flash, I've used flash. I've used even flash extenders called better beamers. Um, I believe that, that with the exception of hummingbirds that I think in Costa Rica are used to um, getting their, their food from multiple setups with five flashes around them. Um, I've noticed birds flinch every time I've, I've done a flash, even if I don't have a lot. So if I can, my preference is to, is to use natural light and to deal with, with the light that's there. Uh, one other thing about the photo of the hawk on the camera, um, there was a lot of post-production done to it because if you look to the right, it's almost like um, an artwork tree trunk that's been that's been blurred on on that photo on the right hand side if you look real carefully um, and that's where backgrounds make a difference because if you have that totally in focus it's, it's going to attract the eye there so the photographer did a little bit of of um, of blending of that tree trunk in just some of the things you start start to notice as you as you get more familiar and with, with your cameras, if you have a heavy lens, um, you need a good tripod. Because I've, um, I've seen very expensive camera equipment put on very inexpensive tripods and they tip over and that's, that's not, a, not a good thing to do. With your phones, um, something really inexpensive uh, can, can work really well. So at home, um, I photograph birds almost all the time in the winter, mainly through, mainly in the winter, but you know, when the juvie birds come here in the summer also, um, through my windows. And I don't have the cleanest windows in the world, but I do try to, from time to time, um, clean my windows because big smudges will make a difference. Um, you can set up your, your feeders and your perches so that they're optimal for, for your windows. Um, the real key is to have the house darker than the outside or at least the same level. Um, that will help your photography through windows more than anything else. And I try to keep the camera close to the window and perpendicular, so almost like a, a T to the window. I find if I angle my camera at all, the imperfections in my window show more than if I if I photograph it straight. And I also have some window feeders that I've I've put my iPhone right up to the window and, and been able to snap some pictures of birds at feeders that, that come to the window. But I also don't want to do flash through windows. If I open the window, and I, I have done this where um, particular birds are coming to the feeders, like um, cedar wax wings, and I'll quietly open a window and I'll shut the room so the cat doesn't go out the window. And I'll start photographing out the window, almost like it's a photo blind. Um, that's, that's really um, preferred if, if you can do it. But the photo on the left-hand side of the pileated woodpecker um, was taken through the window. So the light was just um, pretty, pretty special that day. It was really lighting up um, his head and it was making these round circles behind like these um, specular highlights. So it was really, it was really fun. And I could crop this um, and not have the suet feeder there. Uh, I wanted to show where my suet feeder was on the log 
Um, I could take, if I wanted to, in post-processing, some of the suet off his beak. Um, but I sort of like this just, just the way it is. Um, and you can see even through the window, the amount of feather detail on the chest. That's the thing is if you get birds in the right light, they're no longer just a black chest. It's, you can start to see the details on how the feathers are, are structured. All right, so it is all about light. Um, and time of day is really important. Um, birds are more active in the morning. Later in the day is great for, for photography too. During those times of day, your light's changing a lot um, at sunrise, sunset. So you have to do more exposure adjustment. In the middle of the day, the light is overhead and it causes shadows. It's harsh. It can give um, a little speckled effect on the birds themselves. So you want the sun to your back. Uh, for me, over my right shoulder, but either shoulder. So it's a little bit on an angle, not directly, um, because the angle will, will create a catch light or reflection in the bird's eye. And the most challenging thing is when the sun is behind the bird and for some reason, birds of prey like to sit with the sun behind them all the time. And there is a way to, to deal with the backlit situation. What you end up doing is having a pure white sky um, when a bird is backlit. But if it's the only opportunity to get that picture of the bird and the bird's not moving and you're not moving the sun, you do what you can. So now I want you to watch very closely to the, at this bird's eye, because you see the difference? There's a catch light now in the eye and that makes a big difference in the bird. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna, here's the eye without the catch light, with the catch light. And that's why the light is so important because otherwise um, a lot of the bird's eyes are very dark. And if you don't have a little bit of a catch light in them, their eyes look not dynamic. They almost look um, they they almost look like they're not they're not real, and that's not true in birds that have yellow eyes like uh, snowy owls and some of them. But a lot of birds have very dark eyes, and so that light really does a nice job. Also, on this picture of the crow, um, the light is just picking up all the um, the the reflections in in the in the feathers, they're not, they're not just black, they're really iridescent. And so you need light to do that. Um, particularly birds like in May, when we get our indigo buntings back, uh, in the wrong light, they look like a black bird. In the right light, they're magnificent. Um, but they, um, and sometimes that blue light, my focus doesn't even see that bird. It's the strangest thing because the bird really isn't blue. It's the reflective light that you're seeing to make the bird look blue. So you can shoot into the sun. Uh, so for every rule in photography, we always say there's an exception to that rule is you can shoot into the sun. And, and this was taken, this was taken in Nebraska and it was not a, um, it, it's not a, um, composite. It, it, the, I actually caught the crane right there in the sun. That was, we had about um, a week's worth of miserable weather and cold and icy and um, gray days. And then we had like, you know, probably 14 minutes of incredible sun. And this bird just flew exactly where it needed to be. And the challenge of doing birds there is there's thousands of birds. So to get one bird and not have lots of parts of other birds, um, it was really great. So when you shoot into the sun or if you're shooting into a bird that's backlit, um, the, the bird will be in a silhouette. And to make the sun show, this is a case where I underexposed the picture by a lot. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to get any detail on the bird. If I wanted detail on the bird and no sky, I would have overexposed um, to be able to, to get 
get some detail in the bird. Now I'm going to talk about that later. You can shoot into sun. Um, you know, there, there was the old thing that you will burn your lens out. Um, you're more likely to hurt your eyes than to hurt the lens um, and camera. You just don't want to do it a lot. But birds at sunset going through orange skies and big balls of fire are just really, really fun to, to get. So let's talk a little bit about composition on birds. Um, and I picked this picture, it's it's a African crown crane and they're, they're pretty spectacular. Um, this is a Getty image picture and it breaks all the, the rules of composition that people traditionally talk about. Because traditionally the rule is put, the, put your subject not in the middle, put it in, in one of the intersecting lines and the rule of thirds. Um, some people say never take a picture of a bird straight on because their faces are so weird looking straight on. Um, but this works. Um, so for any rule, uh, and if you want to get creative, I like sometimes birds straight on. Um, you get really funny expressions and different types of things. Um, we're going to talk about later on, I'm going to show this picture again, but while it's big, really look at the back feathers. Uh, this was taken, and you can get fairly close to these crown cranes in Africa. So it was taken probably um, with somebody that was fairly close to the bird. And the fact that the nostrils or the holes on the beak and the eyes and the feathers, the black feathers on the head are all um, perfectly in focus means that there was probably a lot of depth of field. You know, a, a, an f-stop where there's, and Africa, you get tons of light all the time. But notice how the back feathers are a little tiny bit falling out of focus. And that's because of um, this bird would need to get everything in focus. You'd need probably an um, f-stop that the camera didn't even have. But, you know, I like it. It's just different. Um, so for every rule or suggestion I'm going to make on, on composition, you can break it too, because this is, this is a creative, it's an art, it's not rules. So the most important thing is to try to not have your photo so busy that you can't see the bird in the background. You can't say, well, is this a story about a bird or is it a story about a bush? Um, so you want to try to do as simple backgrounds as you, as you can. Uh, that's been, I think, in some cases taken to an extreme where you've got these incredibly beautiful bird pictures, but they could have been done in a zoo. They have no environmental context at all. So I think there's a balance. And those are all um, birds that are set on purchase to make them really, really pretty pictures. Position of the bird, um, again, typically we want to use the, the, the rule of thirds, which I always like to call a guideline of thirds, um, to where you might put the bird's eye. But that would be if the bird was in profile, not straight on at you. And the rule of thirds, if you picture nine quadrants um, on, your, on your screen or your area that you can photograph, it's where the lines intersect. That's, that's any of those places are the rule of thirds. But you can break the rule to get creative. Um, there's, there's times when it's perfectly fine to break it. The most important thing with birds is that if they're looking, walking, flying, and you have some empty space to give the bird some space, and in most wildlife photography, you want to have a little bit of room for that, that bird or um, animal to feel like there's movement, uh, you want them in that direction. So if they're flying um, from left to right, you'd have a little bit more empty space to the right. Um, the same thing for a, a bird that might be walking. Uh, have them go towards the empty space. And a lot of people will criticize um, birds flying away or butt shots um, of birds. I like them if the bird is sort of turning a little bit and looking back, because you can then sort of say, this is the story of the bird's journey. And sometimes, you know, 
uh, you can have birds flying away because you want it at the very end of a story. So again, for every composition rule, there's a time that you can also, um, you can also break it. It's really hard with birds in flight. When you first start doing birds in flight, you're more likely time you get the bird and get it nicely acquired, it's going by you. So that's where um, a lot of times you, you get just the back end of the bird. But if you can get a little bit of the head or if it's telling the story of the birds flying off into the sunset, that's great. The, pr the problem with composition with birds is unless you know and you're in an area where they're, they're going to fly in a certain direction or they're going to walk from point A to point B and you've watched them and they do it, a lot of times you end up just photographing the bird the best you can and then in your post-processing or your cropping, you then cr get creative. So if you have, and most people have cameras now, even the cell phones have so many megapixels to them. I'm gonna wait till my nuthatch gets done talking. Okay. Uh, that one thing I do, particularly with flying birds or, or a large bird like a heron that's walking is I will, I will shoot it a little bit loose, so not as tightly in, so that I know that I'll have a little bit of, of room to play with if I want to recompose it in post-processing, because I can't make that bird, I can't make the bird go where I want it to go, um, unless, again, you're doing photography in a blind and there's been setups and you can predict where the, where the birds go. So sometimes having that little extra to to play with really could help um, later on work on that photo. So the best bird photos to me capture uh, behavior, feeding, bathing, preening, you know, these two pileated, probably that one's taken again through my, my window and um, the one on the left is a young one and the one on the right is Papa. You can tell the difference. The, the, um, older birds, red on his head is a little bit more red. The, and, I, and I had been watching them come in and out. And when this bird, the baby was younger, Papa would feed it, um, which is always great if you can get two birds feeding each other. And they'll feed each other once they leave the nest. The, a lot of, of adult birds will continue to feed their young. Um, but also mates will feed each other as a, a way of giving a gift for um, mating or an engagement present. So uh, looking for that, looking for that behavior. Um, and you can see I was focused on the on the bird on the left because um, those wings are are nice and, and sharp. On the right, the, the back bird's wings start to fall off. That's that's a problem with uh, lack of depth of field. Um, but if I had more depth of field, then the background would have, there would have been more trees. And again, the eye fills in. The, what you look at mostly is the interaction between the two. Again, trade-offs. Um, and then the bird on the right was at the Arboretum. Um, it's a green heron. And um, I would just, I waited and waited. And he just started again, that relaxed behavior of preening and working on the feathers. Once you have a bird doing that, if you can sit down and be quiet, you, you then have somebody that you can start thinking composition and you can start thinking about, ah, can you move your head this way? Can you move your head that way? It almost becomes like, like a, little, um, a, little, a little model um, that starts to work with you. Um, but it takes a little bit to sort of sneak up on them and then wait. And, um, Ingrid, this was taken with my Olympus. So, um, and what I like is the feather detail on the on the wing feathers. The other thing is, if you really want to get that behavior, you have to go back to the same locations a lot. This um, meal Oriole's nest, um, meal Oriole feeding a nest, was at Easton Park about oh, three or four years ago now, maybe four. And, you know, every spring I look for oral nests and it, 
at that point, Eastern Park wasn't as popular as it is now. And so I'm not seeing, I'm not finding the nest there. But once I found this nest, I would I would go there almost every day. And what I do is once I, if I find a bird's nest like that, and it was high up in the tree, it was right over the path, is um, I will try to see when is the first sign that I see that they're feeding young. And then I'll go and look up on the Cornell side or in a couple of different books that I have um, will tell me typically how long it is between when birds hatch and when they fledge. So then I can say, ah, this is my window of opportunity to really observe this bird. And um, so I go back lots of times, um, particularly if, if I'm watching watching for that behavior. And that's true. The, the um, the first round of bluebirds at the Arboretum, and it varies based on, on weather and different things, is um, usually about Mother's Day, the first um, clutch or a little families of bluebirds start leaving the nest there. The tree swallows will nest almost um, for a long time, but I'll even get to know a single box at, at the Arboretum, and I'll go like you know, for a 10 day period, I might be there every other day to see what progress those those little ones are making. And that's how you get the behavior. Sometimes you're really lucky and you just stumble across it. But um, to really anticipate key events, um, you have to you have to put the, the time into to really watching and, and going back. And that's true with with um, you know, I know there's at, at the Arboretum, I know there's a couple of red-shouldered hawks that are pretty much there every time I'm there. Um, and so I, I, and I know um, red-shouldered hawks start to do their nesting in February. Um, eagles are probably, it's January, they're probably sitting on the nest now. I haven't been to Cool Spring, but you start to know and really anticipate. That's how you get that's how you get the the um, really good moments. So I, I covered this if you were at the bird presentation, but um, you know I also will look up on eBird uh, what's going on if at, at a particular birding site nearby. Here's a list of different ones. Um, and I added in there in Shenandoah County, um, Seven Bends, State Park is a new state park and it's it's going to be really good for habitat because the they have trails along the Shenandoah River and they've got that mix of edge forest and fields so that's that's going to be a fun place to go. The other place that um, if you have a little bit of time where birds are really um, a little bit less shy in Fairfax County is Huntley Meadows. Um, it's not a bad ride down there. It takes a, a little over an hour um, and there's boardwalks and they have um, lots of great birds and you can look up on eBird, what are people seeing at Huntley Meadows? And um, they have um, a whole boardwalk system and, you know, I, I'll even, I'll even sort of get low on that, that boardwalk and take pictures from, from the boardwalk. But that's a, a list of, of different places. And then if you can get um, in the winter, in particular, um, Chincoteague and Assateague, um, and then the Delaware Parks, um, a refuge, have incredible snow geese that will, at sunset and sunrise, um, they change locations because just like the cranes, they, they come to water to roost at night. And if, you, and if you have the right type of sunset or sunrise, um, you'll see one or two birds will start and then there'll be a burst of, of snow geese all, all at once. Um, so it's, it's worth getting over to the Eastern shore. If anybody's doing that, let me know. There's also a place on the way where people have forever been feeding ducks and it's really easy to get pictures of, of um, redhead ducks and all sorts of ducks that you ordinarily wouldn't get pictures of. So. so the most important thing is to, if you want to go out and photograph birds is to do a little bit of planning. And this is true too of just even observing. So one of the, the things I, I spoke about before is the great blue heron rookery at um, Cool Spring. And this is Shenandoah University River Campus at 
Cool Spring. And it's right off Route 7. Um, if you're familiar with Route 7, after you get from Barryville, you cross the Shenandoah River, you can see it in the map there. And then it's a left-hand turn down a, a horrible bumpy road. Um, and then the actual nest is this um, sort of red starburst there. Uh, and it's a farmer golf course. You can walk down, take a right-hand turn, and you'll see that they're um, nesting there. There's at least 20 nests. And a little bit further down along that path there, there's a, a bald eagle's nest too. Much more difficult to, to see. So if you wanna learn about great blue herons, the first thing you'd say is um, what's really fun to photograph, and you probably can do this with not even very long lenses, is when they're nest building. Um, the nests are across the river from where you stand, but the, um, the females will be standing on the nest and their mates will go out and bring them branches. And sometimes they bring them branches that are three feet long. They're really fun to watch. And they'll come flying in and they always fly sort of, <clears throat> down, they'll fly up river and then they'll do a circle and they'll circle around and they'll eventually go down to where their particular mate is. <clears throat> So that process can take three days to two weeks. And so in March, that's like high on my list of um, going and seeing what are, the, what are the herons doing? And they all don't build at the very same time. So if one nest, they're already sitting on eggs, then um, there's, there's always a little bit of construction going on. And the herons will start working, even after they lay their eggs, they'll start bringing in a little bit more sticks and some greenery and different things to make the nest right. They look really flimsy. And in one um, sycamore tree, there can be, there can be 10 nests. They, they like to be colonial nesters. So that's gonna be March and we're almost in February. So that's not very far away. Um, so we get nest building. They lay their eggs, they have two to six eggs, and they can have one to two broods a year. Usually it's one brood, and if something happens to the eggs, they may, um, they may re nest. Their incubation is about a month long. So if they're building in March, then in April, they start to have the babies, and they're these tall, awkward, funny little babies that are jumping up and down on these little flimsy nests. And the adults come in with, with, um, they, they regurgitate, so the babies will look up and then the adults um, open their mouths and, you know, it's quite a little racket. They'll, they'll squawk and the babies will, will make noises if there's more than one baby in a nest, they'll do a little competition. Um, so that's all happening um, during April. And in between, um, after April, after they hatch, they're there for 40, 49 to 81 days, and sometimes the herons come back. So there's a lot of activity on the river at that point. So what do we need to think about if, if we're going to plan to do a photo trip there? So the first thing is notice the big compass I, I put on the, the river. So the river is running north, pretty north-south there. And so what happens is that in the afternoon, the sun is going to be behind the tree with the nests. So afternoon is a really, really tough time to photograph them because the, the nests are gonna be backlit. So the first thing that I would say is um, that if I wanna get better pictures, then morning is gonna be an optimal time. Earlier in the morning when the sun's coming up, um, it will be less harsh, but I may have less light. So I have to, I have to, weigh all those different factors. The other thing that happens is that your optimal time for taking pictures is March and April, mainly because um, the leaves start growing in on the trees and you start to have more and more obscure um, views of the nests. You can see them and you can get some flight pictures, but it's, it's a little bit more challenging. The, there is a cleared out area on, on the um, side where the park is to be able to stand and take pictures. 
And usually you'll find it because um, there's people standing there. But you know, as the as the spring continues, the, one of the challenges you're going to have is you're going to have more leaf cover. So March, April starts to become. If I want to do heron pictures, March, April, I need to be aware of where my the sun's going to be for the optimal time. And I really like the nest building because. Um, they're really, they're, they're funny with these long sticks in their mouth and you get a lot of interaction and you can even see the breeding. The actual nests are further away so that the more they're flying on the river by you on the side that, that you're standing on, the, the easier it is to photograph them. So that's some of the things that, that I do when I'm starting to think about, well, where do I wanna go? Um, you know, I wanna go to Chincoteague, Assateague in the winter for the snow geese. So I want to go spring almost anywhere. Um, also spring, I want to go to um, to see the trillium and also to see if I can if I can find red starts and tanagers and all sorts of beautiful little tiny warblers before the leaves come out at Thompson Wildlife. So part of it is that research and knowing the environment and knowing what time of day do I need to get there for, for the different light? And then isolating birds on a background, um, a lot of times you just have to wait um, and you may not get the picture, but the, um, the picture of the titmouse on the left, these are both stock pictures too. Um, it's really, to me, what you're getting is you're getting a lot of the front blur of the leaves and you're getting dappled light. So this photo was taken at the wrong time of day. It was taken in the wrong position of the bird. Um, it's sort of cute pick, um, peeking out. If, if I had this to do maybe in post-processing, I'd get rid of a whole lot of it and I would just crop it around the eyes poking out because everything else is sort of um, distracting from the picture. So the, the bluebird on the other hand is also in vegetation. It's, it looks like it's in an American holly and they will eat berries. So sometimes if you just wait, the bird's going to get in the position that you want it to. Um, you know, one thing that I might do, and again, if you're doing something for a contest, you're not supposed to remove any objects from a picture but if it was just for me, I might take the red berry that's sitting on his back out um, because my eye is going to that red berry instead of it's competing with the bird. Um, but that's like just tweaks that, that I might do in, in processing. Um, when you have a bird um, that's in vegetation like this, the more shallow your depth of field is, the more you're going to blur the vegetation behind it. You can see that in both of these are pretty shallow depths of field, particularly the bluebird, the holly tree continues, but if you look beyond the bluebird, the, the background is, is not distracting. Um, so if you also have like um, a whole string of, of ducks or, or geese or, um, one of the biggest problems when you have a half a million sandhill cranes at the Platte River is how do I get a picture that isolates a group of birds and doesn't have the wing of one bird or the beak of another bird. And so a lot of times if there's a whole line of birds, I'll focus on the first bird in the line. So if, if there are um, like mergansers on the river and they're in a lot, because a lot of times they'll swim in a line and um, I will, I will compose my picture. So it's the first bird and then maybe a few after that. Um, but the whole line to me, I may not want. At the heron rookery, I'm always looking across the river for, is there a, a heron's nest that's at the top of the tree or on the, um, on the tree there, there's some that stick way out to the right or the left. So I, I'm always looking for the birds on the edges so that I can make the picture about the bird. Now, if I wanted to tell the story about a heron rookery, I would definitely include the whole tree and all the confusion. But if I want the story to be isolated about that um, heron and its mate or its young, 
I'm going to try to look around and say, can I isolate one so that there's not this other stuff around it? And again, like I said earlier, place your feeders away from busy backgrounds. So and increase the space between your bird and the background and just experiment with your lens. How far does the bird feeder have to be away from that green tree to get it um, so it's nice? And then if you're not using the picture for competition, you can remove distractions and post-processing. Um, I've removed a lot of branches. Um, it's really time consuming. And if the branch is running on the bird's body, it's harder to do. But if it, if there was a branch, for example, above that bluebird, you know, I could, again, for my own use, I could take that branch out very easily. So this is a picture at, um, that I took at the State Arboretum. Um, and I know it's hard with everyone on. Um, Everybody guess where I was at that time. To get this picture of, um, of the heron from the heron's, almost the heron's perspective. And um, I was in the mud at Lake Arnold, like really stinky mud. And I've also learned to put a, a trash bag and a, another pair of clothes in the, in the car because um, if I see a heron doing something like this, um, there's a good chance that I'm going to end up a very muddy person. Um, if I took this picture from above the heron, it would be a whole different story. If, um, so I, I'm constantly trying to get low. The other thing is I'm less threatening to the heron. And you can tell it's a, it's a little bit of a windy day because my reflection is rippled instead of perfectly clear. But I was sort of happy that I was able to focus on the poor little fish's eye and also the heron's eye. And so and this is a young um, great blue heron because the throat um, has this sort of um, different variegated colors. And what you'll see, and I hope everyone does go to, to Cool Spring, is that the mature ones, their white on their face is much brighter and they'll have um, a blue sort of um, feathers that come from the back of their head. And most great blue herons take about three years before they are mature enough to, to mate. And the eyes are, are a little bit um, yellower on the herons. So, so getting low, um, the picture on the, of me on the um, top is in Florida and um, I've also been on my belly, but um, I've always said that I, I might do a book on yoga for photographers. Those are black vultures that are um, around the, the camera. Um, but that's my tripod as far down to the ground as it, it can be. That's a, a 600 lens. Um, we were actually taking pictures of alligators um, with the red filter on the flash to try to get it, their eyes to be really funky. Um, but yes, getting, getting low can be a challenge. That's why having a ground pod sometimes, sometimes works. Um, I was pretty, pretty stinky and dirty after that. The bottom picture is a little bit distorted. It, it's um, a, special, a special little platform boat that um, I did loon photography and, and you can see I'm sitting way up on my knees. At that point, we were taking a break from lying on our bellies, but um, we lie on our bellies and we're taking pictures, you know, that there are even photographers that have blinds that float, but this was pretty special because the loons, it makes very little noise. It was especially adapted for, um, for wildlife photography. Uh, but lying on your belly for a few hours taking photos can be can be a little bit challenging too, but a really nice way and to get intimate and and again we approach the loons and wait it and and um, it's really fun to see that many adults just sitting really quietly enjoying um, enjoying an opportunity. So get low and get dirty. Um, if you don't have long lenses. Um, with your 
your camera phones. Think about environmental pictures. Think about sunset and, and geese. This is again, um, you can well imagine the noise on the Platte River when you have that many cranes all of a sudden taking off all at once. And uh, what happens is they'll be on the river, they're either coming in, but they look like they're going up. Um, there was probably an eagle that was um, coming by. So you start to look and you see an eagle and you say, we're going to get a burst. And that's true with the, with the snow geese too during the day. So, you know, um, it's not just about the details and the portrait pictures. It's also, you know, getting a picture of what are these, what are these birds doing and in, in, in the environment. So some tips about um, using your smartphone, um, definitely burst mode. That means just hold down your finger because um, you never know which of those photos the bird may not be moving. Try videotaping near a feeder and I'll, I'll demonstrate it. Uh, unless you have a newer phone, newer phones have some zoom features. The older phones when you, when you pinched and zoomed using the pinching you were just pulling apart the pixels you weren't really getting any closer it's better to take the picture if you don't have a zoom lens um, take the picture and then crop it do animal scapes like the like the cranes um, and then um, digi scoping is if you are a birder they have a, a device you can put on a birding scope and all of a sudden your, your iPhone becomes um, a super, super camera. These two pictures were both taken with, with my iPhone. So it is possible to do bird photography with an iPhone. A little bit more challenging, but again, if you are patient and, and do it, you, you can definitely um, do it. Particularly birds like, um, like geese, at, at um, Shenandoah University, there's a great blue heron that hangs out in one of the ponds there. He's pr that heron's pretty tame. Um, so any place where it's a more urban environment, um, probably the birds over it at, at the museum in the Shenandoah Valley, there's probably opportunities to be able to, to get some snaps with your, with your phones. So the, these, this picture, um, on, the, on the left is a video that I'm going to play. Um, and on the right, all I did was took a freeze frame out of, it's a, uh, one of the videos, probably not this one. And then I just, I just did a screen cap and I then um, cropped the picture of the hummingbird. So getting a picture of a hummingbird in flight with a regular camera is really challenging, but doing it via video with your phone, it's possible. And that's what I recommend um, doing is the phones have incredible video. Play with the settings. There are ways of getting different frame rates and slow motion on, on your videos. And the newer phones have 4K and more videos that give you an image that, you know, is not a bad little image of, of this hummingbird. So I'm going to play the video. It's not very, this one's not very long. But all I did is I put my camera... Uh, my cell phone on a tripod, I hit video and I ran in the house <laughs> or, I, or I went a little bit further away and, and they come back to the feeders, particularly hummingbirds will come back. These are all juveniles. There's a, an adult meal that comes in very quickly, but there's a point at which the hummingbirds are so acclimated to the feeders. There's so many young ones that they start flocking at the feeders and um, so Here's, here's the video. It was just very quick, but you could see that you can play with having your feeders out there, set up your, your feeders like the, like the example in the beginning and start to um, run some video and then snap some pictures out of that video. Um, you can do bird photography, uh, big, environmental ones when we've got skein of geese coming at sunset, you know, there's lots of opportunities to, to do things. Sometimes hawks are, are, will sit and be in a tree and, and you, can, you can get those photos. So a um, little bit more challenging, but, but it is doable. 
So I'm going to I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions before I go into this is the the warning point. I'm now going to get a little bit more technical about settings on your on your um, more uh, pro bodies or, or cameras that you can adjust settings. So any questions before I launch into the technical part? I take that as a no, but again, it, you, you're welcome to stay. Um, there's always things that you can learn about exposure and settings. Okay, so technical. Um, we did this a few weeks ago. All of, all of photography are trade-offs between um, your aperture in terms of your depth of field, your sensitivity on your camera, how grainy or how, um, how much light you can let in onto the sensor, and your exposure time. With bird photography, unless you've got a perching bird that isn't moving a whole lot and you've been watching it and you know it's not gonna move, this bird photography is always about shutter speed. And so if you have to sacrifice, if you have to trade off, um, particularly if you're not extremely close to the bird, not like the African crane, also, if you're like taking a bird and you're not as, you're I further back doing with it. then then you, what you want to do is you want to open but your your aperture so that you let in the the most possible light and at the same time go to the sensitivity that is tolerable for your camera so you know, I have different cameras that will do different things. Uh, you know, on my Olympus, I like to stay at 1,000 or 1,200. On one of my new Canons, I'll push up to 3,200 or, or more. Um, they just have different sensors. And so it's, it's a trade-off. Um, the aperture that you can set is lens dependent. And for most bird photography people, every lens has its sweet spot. Um, you can shoot f8 or but if I want light and I want speed I'll go down um, to like f4 which is on my on my um, my big lens okay so some guidelines for shutter speed because it is it's all about speed so for a perching small bird that this um, that bird is taken at at Easton Park one over 500 is fine. You can even sometimes get away with a little bit less if, if the bird's not moving a whole lot. Um, but if I have enough light, I even for a perching bird, because you never know when they're going to flit around, particularly little birds, are, they, just, they just, they move a lot, one over 1,000. And if they're flitting around in the branches, then one over 1,000 to one over 2,000. But you know, we're also shooting at the beginning and the end of the day. So I have to do all those trade-offs between my ISO and then my shutter speed. Birds flying, again, to get the wingtips really crisp, like on this bluebird, um, one over 3,200. And in that's the time that sometimes I will go when the sun's a little bit brighter to do bluebirds and try to deal with the shadows. Um, you can tell there's a little bit of shadowing on, on that bluebird's head, but do I need light to be able to get that flight motion? Absolutely. For a big bird that's flying like a turkey vulture, one over 1,000, one over 1,500, the herons don't fly very fast. That's another really good reason to to do your flight shots with herons is they they tend to lope they're not like they're not like bullets like ducks um raptors that the um eagle when it's hunting one over two thousand and you're not going to be close to those birds so what you do is you get your aperture as wide open as you can and then um go as much speed as you can and say what iso do i need to be able to make it all work 
quick aperture review. Um, the indigo bunting is um, at McKee's Berkshire that every year in Maryland, um, they have a sunflower field and the indigo buntings love to come and sit on them. And I was fairly far away and this is even cropped. So I, I, I probably photographed that at, at F4. I didn't pull up the, the data. If I had the extender on, then it would be F5, 6. Um, and the reason is it's a small bird and I'm far away. And I wanted the trees behind to be this incredibly beautiful um, green that they ended up being. I didn't have to do anything to the background in, in post-production. So what I did is luckily this indigo bunting was sitting on an isolated sunflower. Um, usually there's a ton of sunflowers and, and this one I just said, I got lucky and everything pulled together. Um, the crane, like I said before, was probably at a higher F stop be because from the tip of its beak to its eyes are all in focus. And then it starts to fall off a little bit as you get to the back feathers. And so depth of field, the closer you are to your subject, the more that subject isn't on the same plane, the higher, the, the more depth of field you need. The further away that you are, and most birds are far away, you can drop um, that number which opens up your aperture and it lets more light in that you need for speed to be able to do it. So default, um, if I'm doing birds, um, F, F4, 5, 6, whatever I can do on the lens I have. When we were doing the loons though, we were really close to those loons and sometimes they would even swim up to the boat. Loons have a very long face like that crane. So F8, because they were close and I didn't want some of it to blur. Um, and we had a lot of sunlight, we had great light. If it was cloudy and darker, um, I, might've, I might've dropped my F stop. But I, they weren't moving, I wasn't doing flight that they were in the water, they were moving very slowly. So those are the, the trade-offs that you do and the decisions that you make. Again, aperture, the first picture of the cranes, uh, the back one is out of focus because the photographer was close and they had a shallow depth of field. The two cranes flying together, I was at F8, I had light, you can see there's a lot of light pouring in and I had speed because the wingtips are nice and, and they're not blurred. Bigger bird, I don't need 3,200 for that. I might need, need 1,200, 1,500. Um, and if I had a lot of light, I crank it up because I want to stop motion. The eagle, again, I was very far away from the eagle. This, this picture's cropped. So my f-stop was as wide open as I could be because I wanted to get and stop the motion. So, so speed, for birds that are, are moving. You wanna set your drives. Everybody who has a camera that has adjustable settings has something called a drive mode. And the drive mode is how fast the shutter button will, will fire if you hold your finger on it. And the default is one picture. There is a way to do it so that it's high speed and some of them are just one or high. And then um, Ingrid in, in the Olympus, there's like a million settings of, of how, many, how many shutter clicks you can have when you're in high. And the same with all the new mirrorless cameras because they, they don't require the mirror to go up and down every time. So the first thing, if you're gonna do birds, you wanna do burst rate. And so you need to find on your camera, the drive mode, and you need to set it to high. The only disadvantage of setting it to high if you're taking pictures of flowers is that you may get 10 pictures when you only wanted three. But now um, with, with the cost of cards and data, the downside of that is you just have to sort more pictures. But high, high drive mode is really necessary for bird photography. The other thing is most bird photography is done with autofocus. Um, and these are examples of where your autofocus settings are. Your autofocus settings can be on your lens, like the one on the right where it says Canon, 
Um, sometimes when you're not autofocusing, you went from AF, autofocus, to MF, manual focus. Um, so you have to make sure your lens is set for autofocus. With a smartphone, it's where you tap and hold and you see the letters AF, AE lock. And you see on the back of the camera on the upper left, which looks like a Nikon, um, AEL, AFL, AF on. Those buttons on the left, AE is uh, um, the auto exposure, auto focus, and L for lock. So if you want to lock it because you're saying I, I'm composing it, I know what I want and I don't want it to change settings, you press the lock button. You can also press the AF on for it to start to, to do the drive mode to focus. There's also a setting on your, your, your menus where you have to pick that you want to be in autofocus versus manual. Most of the time the cameras are default to, to um, the auto mode, but if you're not autofocusing for some reason, check that you haven't pressed the lock button. Make sure you're, if you have on your lens the option for doing auto versus manual that you've, you haven't slid it by, by mistake. The other thing you see on the lens is a stabilizer on or off. And I, if you have that option on your lens, I always have my stabilizer on. The only time I turn the stabilizer off is if it's on a tripod, because um, you don't need stabilization. And sometimes the cameras will actually do funny things if they're locked down tight on a tripod. But if there's wind in a tripod or a gimbal head, I keep the stabilizers on now. Um, so sometimes your camera has problems autofocusing and a term for that is hunting. And you'll, you'll hear the camera, it will start going, air, air, air. the lens, you can actually hear the drive motor going back and forth and being unhappy. And the, some of the reasons that your autofocus system will do that is that if you don't have a lot of contrast, your autofocus system works on contrast. So if you were trying to take a picture of a white wall, it has nothing, there's no black or contrasting color for it to be able to focus on an object. So in that case, a white bird in snow, a foggy day with a, a something in the fog, your system might hunt a little bit. In low light, it may just not see the subject at all. Overlapping elements, like if you have a bird and then you have a lot of branches and stuff around it, your, your system might not know, do, I, do you want me to focus on this little bird or these twigs over here? And it may go back and forth. And what it will focus on is the area where it has the most contrast. If your subject is small, if you're taking a picture of a bird and, it, and when you look through your, your viewfinder, if it's not even filling one of your focal points, that poor camera, if, if, it's, if there's nothing else there, it will lock on. But if there's a lot of other things there, it can get confused. And then the other thing is that um, your autofocus won't work if you're too close to an object, every lens has a minimal focus distance and that is on the lens. So I've been out with some people taking pictures of wildflowers and they say, my camera's broken, it won't focus. And they were like a speck away from that flower. And if they backed up then a little bit away, then their, their lens focused. That again is lens specific. So my 600 lens won't focus on my bird feeders as closely as my one to 400. Every lens has a different minimal distance you have to be from the subject for its autofocus system to work. Within the autofocus system, there are different modes and these are really um, important. So you can see on the back, um, this is a Nikon and there's different, AF is autofocus. And I'm gonna explain each of these modes. So first thing we wanna do is have your shutter so that when you press it for birds that it's going, -do 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 -do, it's, it's shooting as fast as you can. Then you wanna be, make sure you are on autofocus. Then we wanna pick a continuous autofocus mode and continuous means it will continue to focus 
um, on that bird or that object. And it's called different, it's called different things on um, different models. So um, it may be AF, C, AF, meaning C for continuous. Canon calls it servo, AI servo. Um, they're basically, Canon is always a little bit different with its language. What the camera does if you're in continuous is that it will lock on your subject and then it will track that subject as it moves in the frame. So that's a really important thing because birds move. Unless the bird is sitting, the bird's going to move and tracking can be really helpful. You don't need this for a rock. You don't need it for a landscape. You don't need it from flowers, but continuous focus for doing any wildlife photography is very, very, very handy. So you lock on the subject and the subject's moving. And if you're in this continuous mode, as you move the camera and keeping the subject close to your focal points, it will continue to lock on to the subject. But if you really recompose dramatically, you, you can unlock off that subject. You have to do some tracking physically with moving the camera itself. So the different modes are, um, you can be in single, but we wanna be in continuous, but you can be in single servo um, on the Nikon, one shot on Canon, single on Sony. But for birds, we want to be in, con uh, again, continuous servo, AI servo, and continuous for Sony. And for Olympus, it's called um, SAF. But you can sort of, or, or I'm sorry, it would be CAF, and it was in the A menu. So everybody has different menus. It, to find this mode will be in your autofocus menu. So the other thing is you can pick how many focus, focus points you want this system to use. So let's review back. We're in a continuous mode so that when you're pressing the shutter button, it's, it's, it's continuing to have that shutter fire as quick as it can. Um, you can, if you hold it too long, it can buffer and then nothing else, it will have to catch up with you. Um, you want to be in a mode that's continuously focusing so that it tracks the subject for birds. And then the next thing you have to pick is, well, how many focus points do you want active at any time? In the picture that I'm showing you there, it's called a single focus point and it's locked on the bird's eye. But there are other focus points as you can see in the bottom there. Single point, is a designated area. Group will use several focus points. And so what the group is, it's like little helper points around the single point. So you focus on your subject and hopefully you're focusing on the bird, the bird's head, if it's big bird, the bird's eye. You put your middle focus point there, but they can be anywhere between four or nine or even more points that surround that middle point. And then that way, if, if the bird moves a little bit, one of the helper points is also going to maintain focus. So, and in the newer cameras, like my newest Canon has um, face and eye detection. It's basically using this group mode and it's recognizing in the software, um, either a human eye you can set it for or an animal's eye. And it does a pretty darn good job of tracking in that group if the bird starts to move its head. The other mode is a dynamic one, and that has even more, more focal points so that if you, say you had a group, say you had the middle single point and you had four points around it, and the bird wandered completely out of that in the dynamic one, the camera then says, ah, you don't want to be over here with the group because they're not helping you anymore. You want to be over here and we're going to pick up the focus for you. So as you go down these different options, as the photographer, you 
give to the camera more and more decision making of what focal points it's going to activate. So most of the time I'm in single point or a very small group. With my newer camera, I'm letting it do a little bit of eye detection because it's smarter than my old cameras. But that's a decision that you need to make of which, how many points you're going to let the camera decide where it needs to be. And in birds in flight, this can be a really helpful tool. So again, the Canon has some options. Um, as you can see, the first one is a very tiny point. Um, and I like that one if I am working with a larger animal and I can pinpoint on the eye because I want that eye very, very sharp. Then it can go to uh, another single point and then what I call the cross, the square. And then as you start to see the, the bracket things, then that camera's going to decide which of those which of those points that are shown below you really want. And I very, very rarely will use those dynamic. That's the dynamic ones. Um, the Sony has a gazillion points. Um, this is just in your wide points. You can check off which ones you want to use. And the same thing in Canon. I even have some of these options turned off completely. And on the right is the Nikon different, different points. I recommend in Nikon either to use single point or dynamic area nine point. The dynamic area nine point is pretty accurate from all my friends that are, are um, Nikon users. The 3D tracking is more like this sort of let the camera make a decision. But this is something to play with. And the best way to play with it is if you have a dog, take the dog to the dog park and try these different AF types of, of, of points. Um, it, again, how much control do you want the camera to decide than, than not? The total number of, of focal points available, if you look on the back of the Canon, that one is looks like a, a, a 7D or a 5. Um, some of the cameras don't have that many focal points. The number of focal points depends on how fancy the cameras are. The newer mirrorless ones, the Olympus and Sony have a gazillion. I think they have 54 focus points. Um, and if I was using single point, the difference is if the bird was somewhere else, I have to quickly move that single point up, down, left, right, or I have to compose and then recompose. With the dynamic one, it will move a little bit um, when you go to that wide area. It moves around for you. It's again, how much control do you want? So the zone or group focus points where you're letting the camera make this decision, um, if you see the mallet on the left, you can see that it's not hitting the eye, it's hitting the wing, which may be better than hitting nothing if you're just new to birds in flight. But if you're more proficient and you're really good at tracking, then I would want it on the bird's eye rather than on the wing. And that's the problem with, with these auto zone or group focus points is that they tend to, they tend to make the decision for you. The example on the right, I would not be unhappy with the focus point hitting the beak instead of exactly on the eye, given the, how fast that bird is moving. So they, those dynamic or group types of ways of doing focusing really are sort of designed to help you because as birds are moving, jumping, flying, doing things, it's sometimes really hard unless you're proficient at, at tracking them to get that focus point on the bird. The other thing is both these examples is there's not a lot going around in the background and the birds are the most contrasty thing in the whole setting. The other thing when you use group or zone is that as you're panning with the bird, if there's a tree or something that's really contrasting, those focus points can totally pull off, off the bird. So you just have to watch it and get used to it. 
<clears throat> the other thing that um, that the cameras have is something called an automatic AF or autofocus assist illuminator or beam. And for wildlife, I turn it off. <clears throat> If you've ever noticed, there's a red beam sometimes that comes out and hits the subject when there's not a lot of light. It helps if you um, are doing <clears throat> focusing and don't have enough light, but that red light could just scare away your subject completely. So I, I always turn it off. And this is an example from a Nikon menu system. All right, so the application and the reason I talk about focus points is all about birds in flight. So birds in flight, this graphic on the left is inconsistent with what I, I presented before. It's, um, it's consistent with songbird, wading birds, gooses, but gliding raptors, I never shoot at one over 640, one over 1,000 or one over uh, 1,200. I'm a little bit over, well, not pretty, but it's showing some pretty neat pictures. I'm ready to make one. How much longer do you think it's going to go? I don't have the size. It's 1130. Sorry, it's almost 12 now, so I know. this is the technical stuff that I'm not really all that interested in, but they're showing some deep pictures along the way. <laughs> okay, so um, let me get back. So in this, for okay, birds in flight, you definitely one. want to be in, in oh, um, autofocus in. continuous right. or or servo, okay. and you can go with a group mode if, if you're new at it, and then start to have more and more control over your focus. Again, it's all about speed. This is speed. You sacrifice your ISO, you, you go to your ISO that you say, I'd rather have that bird not blurry. I'm gonna bump it up to the point where my camera functions okay. I'm gonna be wide open with my f-stop because birds in flight, you're very rarely very close to them. So you don't need a lot of depth and field. You want the highest frame rates per second, except for like on Sony and Olympus, which can get, give you such a high frame rate that you'll fill a card up. So, you know, at like 12, 12 or nine a, a second is great. And then if you want to be in a semi-auto auto mode, um, you could be in shutter priority where you set your shutter speed. Um, it will automatically set your aperture for you and then you can set the ISO. Aperture priority, you would set the, you would set the um, aperture. So you might set it at five, six if you have a camera. Your um, zoom lenses, um, some of them when you zoom all the way out to um, 600 or 400, may be at 7.1. So your aperture is going to be what your aperture is. Um, and you could, it will automatically shut, um, set your shutter to, a proper, to have a proper exposure. And you just, what you do there then is you up your ISO, it will then keep upping your shutter speed. If you're in aperture priority and you're doing birds in flight, watch what your shutter speed is. Cause it, especially at dawn or dusk or, you know, as the sun's going down, you can lose shutter speed and you have to keep an eye on it and keep bumping up your ISO. I, I also use auto ISO, um, which is a quasi manual, quasi, um, quasi um, semi-automatic. And, but I don't do it if it's constant light. Like right now, the light's pretty constant. I'm looking out the window. Um, and I would use manual exposure, particularly for birds in flight. If I use auto ISO, I have to worry about overexposing for the sky. And I'm going to explain that. Um, when you're actually shooting um, birds in flight, an athletic stance, grip, your camera with your right hand, your left hand goes under your lens, have that lens foot up um, and follow the bird with your body. If any of you have done skeet shooting or anything, you just, it's the same, same type of thing. The key to being able to um, do birds in flight is to be able to 
acquire your focus when they are a speck. You know, I've done I've done some very difficult birds on flight uh, in flight, and I I'll look at them and say they're just a tiny bit in my in my camera, but I'm going to start tracking them as soon as I can acquire focus, and I wait for them to fly towards me. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they veer off. And then some people bump the focus, it's called, um, as the bird approaches. So rather than hold, your focus starts to acquire if you're using your front button, your shutter button, halfway down is your focus. Um, you press halfway down and then watch the bird as it comes. You might put your finger up and reacquire focus real quickly. That tends to help reacquire it. I've also lost birds doing it, so it depends on your camera whether you hold that focus or not. You have, you have to mentally really focus on what you're doing. Um, don't let people talk to you. <laughs> I've had people like try to talk to me and I'm like, oh, don't talk to me right now. And the best things to, to practice on big, slow, predictable birds like vultures. You know, at, at the State Arboretum, if you go into the staff parking lot, they come, they come into the trees there and they're in a very predictable flight pattern and they fly pretty slow. So they're really great birds to start with. And, and then you're not all excited, like I've got this eagle I'm trying to track and I've, I've never done it before. So why do we overexpose the sky? Um, if you're in a semi-auto mode, this is in semi-auto mode. Um, the problem is if you have an, a heron or an eagle that's sort of darker and it's flying in a very bright blue sky or a gray sky, your, your exposure meter is mainly getting all the reflected light from the sky and it's saying it's flooding me with light. This scene needs to be much darker. And what you get is you get a dark bird when you let the camera just expose for its metering. So you'll get a, a blue sky, lovely sky, but the bird will be shadowy. And in the histogram for this picture of this magpie, the white's fine, but the black, you can't even see the eye or, or see anything. So what we need to do is always have our histogram, particularly when we're looking at the sky, more over to the right if we want detail on the bird without making it hit all the way to the right. So what's the solution? If you wanna stay in a semi-auto mode, like in aperture or shutter priority, and you're setting either the shutter speed or the f-stop, um, you can also use auto ISO. What you then have to do is use your, your exposure compensation setting, which is the plus minus button. And if you're shooting up to the sky, not down below at tree level, but if you are letting all that reflected light in, you need to then actually brighten the scene, counterintuitive, by plus, plus one or plus one and a half, check your hist histogram. And again, the reason is, is that your auto meter is saying, I've got way too much light, I better darken the scene. The other way to do birds in flight, particularly if they're going to fly in the air and then they may fly down below at, the, at a pond and you don't wanna keep having to go back and forth on your exposure and your light is constant, you take your, your picture, your, your camera you look through for your exposure light meter and focus on something that is is a mid-tone a light you know leaves on a tree a tan gray rock and fill the whole um fill the whole frame with that color and then set your first set your your shutter speed how fast do you want to be set your, your f-stop and your ideal ISO so that your light meter is at zero like the one shown below. And what will happen if the light doesn't change is that if you take pictures of birds that are down at the lake level, your light meter will show at zero. When you flip up to the sky, 
it will do exactly what the exposure compensation is doing and saying, oh my goodness, you're overexposed, but you want to be overexposed or else that bird will be too dark. Because the light meters in your camera are looking at the whole scene, the reflected light. They're not looking at just, there's not enough light coming off the eagle to have it properly exposed. And the most important thing is to check your histogram in the field and to put on your histogram, your blinkies. What will happen is when you have a bright day and you have a bird in the sky or it's backlit, your sky will be blinking. It might end up being white, um, but you don't want the bird blinking. So that's, that's a little bit on, on exposure. I know I've covered incredible, very detail. I think I gave the warning to everybody <laughs> that birds are probably the most difficult subject that we're ever going to photograph around. Um, you know, they just, for all the reasons of light, speed, um, having to know their habitat, they move very fast. But having the right settings, your camera then becomes a tool that lets you be able to expose for those birds properly. Now, I know I've covered a lot and I've managed to fill um, two hours <laughs> as, as usual. And what I'm gonna do is stop the recording and I am going to take some questions. If, and if anybody,